This is the Daytona International Speedway in Florida, the racetrack for the home run hitters in stock car racing. Since 1959, thousands of racing fans have been coming here to watch the Daytona 500. And that's the event we're about to see today on ABC's Wide World of Sports. The weather, clear. Temperature, mid-60s. The wind, gusting lightly. Hello, everybody. I'm Keith Jackson, and welcome to the Super Speedway, one of the fastest stock car racetracks in the world. And in just a few minutes, you're going to see 40 of the fastest stock cars ever go growling off chasing some $200,000 in total prize money. We have already had a binge of record breaking, evidenced by Cale Yarborough, the pole sitter, who qualified at better than 194 miles an hour of breathtaking speed. More on the speed factor from the editor and publisher of National Speed Sport News, Chris Economaki. Thanks, Keith. One of the new looks in stock car racing is on this 1969 Dodge Daytona Charger to be driven by Buddy Baker. It's starting outside front row, and it has a droop snoot, as they say in the racing business, and a high elevated stabilizer at the rear deck, known as a wing. And this wing has made the car considerably faster than it was without the wing. The air rushes down over the top, goes underneath the wing to provide stability, and the air coming off the top of the car goes over this elevated wing, which the mechanic can adjust with this set screw to get the proper angle, which gives tremendous down thrust on the rear side of the car. This allows the car to go through the corners much faster than it would without. A very streamlined and slippery automobile is the Dodge Daytona Charger, capable of better than 190 miles an hour on this two and a half mile track. Now, back to you, Keith. Thank you very much, Chris. And also today on ABC's Wide World of Sports, another kind of daring speed, the World Four-Man Bobsled Championship from Samaritz, Switzerland, as men literally risk themselves hurtling down the icy run. Among the hut contenders for the riches here at Daytona, A.J. Foyt, who won the Riverside 500 in Southern California earlier this year. Three-time Grand National Champion, David Pearson, Spartanburg, South Carolina. He'll be in a Ford. This is young Pete Hamilton of Massachusetts, new teammate of Richard Petty in a Plymouth Superbird. Big Buddy Baker, Dodge Daytona. He sat on the pole last year at Daytona, and this tough guy who will be on the pole this year. One of the remarkable comebacks in sports has been that of Cale Yarborough. The Timminsville, South Carolina driver here smashed into the wall of the Texas International Speedway barely two months ago and broke his shoulder. The doctors first said he may never drive again. Then they reduced that estimate to eight months, and then six months. But here it is, two months later, and he's not only driving, but shattered the track record with a remarkable 194-mile-an-hour drive here at the Daytona International Speedway. Cale, that record run, was that because you had been knocked down? Chris, I think so. I had a long time to lay in the hospital and lay in the bed thinking about what I would do if I ever did return to racing, and I think that this had a, a lot to do with me coming back and running as strong as I did. How did you ever make it, make it back so quickly? Well, Chris, I know I had some help from the good Lord getting well this quick, and I also had thousands and thousands of, of people that, that sent their well wishes, and uh, this was just uh, something that I think really inspired me to get well quick, and I'm not kidding. I think that these people had a lot to do with me getting well. We're mighty happy to have Kale back among us, ready to run again today. Now the president of the Daytona International Speedway, Bill France to get the show on the road. Now, it is time to begin the 1970 Daytona 500 with the world's greatest stock car field. Gentlemen, start your engines. In the first row, on the pole, number 21, Cale Yarborough, 69, Mercury. Number six, outside, Buddy Baker, 69, Dodge. Second row, number 71, Bobby Isaac, 69, Dodge. Number 99, Charlie Glotzbach, 69, Dodge. Third row, number 98, Leroy Yarborough, 69, Ford. Number 22, Bobby Allison, 69, Dodge. Fourth row, number 27, Donnie Allison, 69, Ford. Number 55, Tiny Lund, 69, Dodge. In the fifth row, number 40, Pete Hamilton, 70, Plymouth. Number 14, Richard Brickhouse, 70, Plymouth. Sixth row, number 43, Richard Petty, 70, Plymouth. 
Number 96, Ray Elder, Brothers, California, 69 Dodge. And Chris Economaki, I think it's interesting to note that we'll have a 40 car field this year instead of the normal 50. That's to make the race safer and make for less traffic and less possibility of accidents on the track, Pete. There's 15 Dodges, 11 Fords, 8 Plymouths, 3 Mercuries, and 3 Chevelles out on the track right now. Eight of them are 1970s. There's 30 69 models and a pair of old 1968s on the 31-degree banks of the track right now. And eight of the cars now taking their pace lap qualified at better than 190 miles an hour. This is the first of a number of NASCAR races that will be seen during this year on ABC television. Gail Yarborough, number 21, Buddy Baker, number six. Lead the back. The crowd comes up. Watch the pace car. The pace car is off, and the race is on. As expected, Cale Yarborough jumps for the lead in his Mercury Cyclone, two Dodges fighting for second place. Bobby Isaac and Buddy Baker. Notice the shifting of positions already as they go screaming through the turn, but car number 21, that Mercury Cyclone, with Keel Yarborough, has pulled off into a substantial lead as we begin the race, the 12th annual Daytona 500. Bobby Isaac, number 71. Staying close, Keith. He is not letting Kale pull away despite a more than two mile an hour qualifying speed advantage. The pack starting to string out a little bit, and that's simply because Kale Yarborough is burning. He is running right at 190 miles an hour in that opening lap. Really flying, and Bobby Isaac is right there with him. seven 1970 models in this 40 car field. Well, they've strung out, Keith, and the initial dangers of jamming are over with, and now Isaac closes on Yarborough. One of the things we want to watch all day today is what effect on drafting the wing, the fixed wing, is going to have on some of the Chrysler Corporation products, the Dodges and the Plymouths. Some of the fellows say it disturbs the air behind them. Others say you just need a little different angle. The order. Cale Yarborough, number 21 leads, followed by Bobby Isaac, Buddy Baker, and Leroy Yarborough, and we'll continue our coverage of the Daytona 500 in just a moment. You're watching the 12th annual Daytona 500 in color on ABC's Wide World of Sports, and the leader is Cale Yarborough. Running in second place is Bobby Isaacs. It's Mercury. Dodge, Dodge, in that order. Keith Jackson here along with Chris Economaki. It was anticipated the crowd would go over 100,000 for this event under perfect weather conditions, and it looks like that's exactly what we're going to have. And here comes Buddy Baker moving up inside of Bobby Isaacs. Baker making a challenge for second place, and he has gotten it. It was a close squeeze coming out of the backstretch, Keith, but he moved into the number two spot, and he sets out now after leader Yarborough. Number 21 is Cale Yarborough, the man who shattered the qualifying mark here at Daytona to sit on the pole, winning $5,000 for his speed of better than 194 miles an hour. It is Cale Yarborough, Buddy Baker, Bobby Isaacs, and Leroy Yarborough, and we're checking the lap time, the elapsed time, for Cale Yarborough. We'll tell you how fast he's going. He is traveling at 189.873 miles an hour. And here we've got a problem. That's Richard Petty in the blue Superbird, the 1970 Plymouth. Richard Petty apparently is going out of the race. A big puff of smoke, and he is rolling down easily toward the pit road. And if he takes it behind the wall, that'll confirm our suspicion that he has cooked an engine. Tough break for the two-time winner of the race here, and so early, the first car out. Richard Petty has won 101 NASCAR Grand National events. He won this race twice before, 1964, 1966. David Pearson comes quickly into the fence under the caution flag. He's the NASCAR champion, Keith, and he started 31st past 10 cars on the first lap and has really been coming through traffic along with A.J. Foyt, another man who started deep in the field. And here come all of the leaders into the pits as the caution flag continues to fly. Apparently, when Richard Petty's car blew the engine, it dumped some oil on the track. They'll check to make sure there are 
are no slick spots. The leaders thus take this opportunity to come in to get new rubber, get gas, get squared away, and go back on the track for the green and go racing. Right now, here is Chris with Richard Petty. Oh, Richard, a short race for you. What took place up there? <laughs> I just went down in the corner and blowed the engine and locked up, and as it is, it just uh, didn't give any signs of blowing. It goes quite really too fast, but uh, it, when it blew, that was all it Broke all wide open. I guess it broke it wrong. Richard, what happens in a car when the engine blows? A whole lot of smoke comes up in there most of the time, but uh, down there I ran off to the, uh, to the infield and went back up on the track two or three times and really lucky to, you know, keep it down. Uh, sometimes when uh, you blow an engine like that to get so much smoke in the car you can't even see, but this one wasn't that bad. I guess you run it fast, the smoke just went on out behind the car. Will you take over for Pete Hamilton before the day is over? No, I told him if his tongue's hanging out, he's still going to have to drive the car. Thank you, gentlemen. It'll be interesting to watch young Pete Hamilton, age 27, working with that effective and efficient petty crew behind him. Car number 55, the blue automobile right there with Tiny Lund driving, now is in the lead as a result of the yellow flag and the succession of pit stops. And when the green flickers, Tiny will go sprinting away and into the lead. Tiny Lund has been very busy. He won the Permatex 300 yesterday, was second in the Grand American 250 the day before. So every time there's a car race and somebody's got one that Tiny can drive, he'll go do it and do it very well. So here's the circumstance as Tiny Lund comes down. Cale Yarborough flashing under that green flag is now in a position to start his pursuit of Tiny Lund. And I don't think there's any question about what Cale has a faster car, the Mercury Cyclone, already has proven that it can really get out and go, and you can see here as Yarborough starts his pursuit of the leader, Tiny Lund. He's using a little bit of Tiny's draft, Keith, and is moving in right behind him. Tiny's a tough man to get by, though, knows how to use a lot of racetrack. Let's see what Cale will do when he closes up. That's 31-degree bank up there uh, through that turn as they come off, and Yarborough is mastering right into the bumper, and now he's about ready to make his bid. As Chris said, Tiny knows this track very well. He won the Daytona 500 back in 1963. Hales been taking the high road, Keith. He may get by now. Oops, but Tiny gives him a little bit of stabilizer there. It's kind of risky to get up there because you're getting close to the wall and the air behind this new wing that they're using on some of the cars can be very fickle. But Cale Yarborough, if he is able to pick up the draft here, they'll slingshot right on by him. That's what he's going to try to do going inside of him. Going into turn three, he's got him. The drivers say that the Dodgers and Columbus are the toughest to draft as it tumbles the air. We'll have more in a moment. The leader remains Cale Yarborough, car 21. That's the Mercury. David Pearson moving up on Tiny Lund right here in a battle for second place, and Pearson takes second place. So he moves in behind Cale Yarborough, dropping Lund to third. Leroy Yarborough is running in fourth place along with Buddy Baker, and both Leroy and Buddy are moving up themselves to make a challenge on Tiny Lund's Blue Dodd. The leader, Cale Yarborough, in the Cyclone is well out in front of second place David Pearson. So it's Mercury and Ford and Leroy and Buddy both make it by Tiny Lund with no trouble at all. They just whip right on by him. And so it's Leroy Yarbrough in third place. And it is Buddy Baker in fourth place. And they're moving up on the second place man, David Pearson, rather quickly. You do not see the lead car, Cale Yarbrough, at this time. There he is, coming off the turn. Cale really flying. That's David Pearson in the blue and gold Ford, Leroy Yarborough in the white Ford, Buddy Baker in the Dodge Daytona Charger. They have closed the gap. They were at one time about six car lengths behind Pearson, and now they have moved up. And let's see what happens on the turn here as Buddy Baker moves up inside to challenge Leroy Yarborough. Leroy won't have it. In the battle for third, Leroy takes his position solidly in third, and he's taking a run at David Pearson. So Leroy Yarbrough takes a run at Pearson. Pearson fights him off, and the first 10-lap average, Chris, must really be something. 
just got a key that's 183.299 miles an hour, which means better than 220 down that back straightaway. Wow. These engines turning at better than 7,000 RPM. The minimum weight for a NASCAR Grand National stock car, 3,900 pounds. Most of them probably around 4,000 pounds, so it takes skill and muscle to handle them. It is Cale Yarborough, David Pearson, Leroy Yarborough, and Buddy Baker, the first four cars. There goes Leroy chasing David. He may try to slingshot him off that straightaway. And goes by, he does, and he's going into turn three low. Keith, watch that number 98. There it goes, up the track, lane one, two, three, and right to the top of the track, and that's a handful going laterally. So the Yarborough is one, and Yarborough is two. Kale and Leroy in that order. And the leader, Kale Yarborough, is in trouble. Blue smoke pouring out of his car on front of the grandstand, and he's going to go out of the race. It looks like he fairly exploded an engine. Exploded is the right word, Keith. Both front tires were punctured by the flying metal of that engine, and that's a tough handful to keep straight, believe me. So the veteran from Timmonsville, South Carolina, Cale Yarborough, who fought off what appeared at one time to be a crippling injury late last November down in Texas, came back to sit on the pole with a record-shattering 194-plus miles an hour, led for 26 laps. But here he is out of it, the car crippled, he walks away, certainly disappointed. So that puts Leroy Yarborough into the lead solidly, David Pearson second, Buddy Baker is third, and we'll have more racing for you later. But right now, here's some of that icy daring we promised you. Here is Jim McKay. Thank you very much, Jim, and we have a new leader, Bobby Eisen, number 71, 69 Dodge, has the lead, not securely, but he has it. David Pearson right behind him in a Ford. Charlie Glutzbach in another Dodge has moved up into third and right on his bumper. Bobby Allison, number 22, in a 69 Dodge has moved into fourth place. Pole center, Cale Yarborough, out with a blown engine. So is Richard Petty, and so is A.J. Boyd. The man to watch right here is Bobby Isaacs, who is particularly good on the shorter tracks and won 15 races on the NASCAR Grand National Series last year. He'll get back to the short tracks on March the 1st in the Richmond 250 up in Virginia with this car, Keith. Now let's watch and see if David Pearson is able to draft him here. And again, I'll say a lot of conversation about what the total effect of the wing being used on the Dodge and Plymouths will have to do with drafting. Some fellas say it makes the air tumble a little bit. There's Leroy Yarborough in the pits. Now, he was the leader when we joined Jim McKay for the four man bobs, but he has been in the pits for quite a while. They're looking for trouble in the electrical system, and he has lost at least seven laps sitting in the pits. They're faced with a tough problem, Keith. They don't know what the trouble is, so therefore they don't know what to look for. Here comes David Pearson again, pulling up right behind Bobby Isaac. Here he comes. It's a great battle of the brands, Keith. First the Dodge, and then a Ford, and then back and forth. And no matter what your preference is, this race has got it for those who follow a specific brand of car. It is Ford, David Pearson in the lead. Bobby Isaac, Dodge is in second place, and Charlie Glutzbach in a Dodge is running third. And quite a story on Charlie. He was shot twice last December 1st in an altercation with a former employee. But he's right back here today doing exactly what he loves to do, and that is charge around a racetrack in car number 99. He told me before the race, Keith, that he's carrying one of those bullets in his shoulder, but it doesn't bother him at all. Here comes Bobby Isaac into the pits, indicating some trouble on the right side of his car. Probably wants a new tire on the right side and coming out of turn number two. That is car number five. Buddy Arrington of Martinsville, Virginia, hit the wall. The car stuck on the wall, and he skidded along at least a half mile. Keith, he hit the wall at the very same place in last year's Daytona 500. We hope he's not hurt. They're checking. He's coming out of the car. Meantime, the leaders are moving quickly under the caution flag into the pits. Buddy Arrington being taken out of the car where he'll be taken to the hospital and checked. It'll be a while, surely, before they get the track clean, the yellow flag and the caution lights are out and on. So right now, let us take this time out. The green flag is out, and we're racing again after Buddy Arrington's accident. Charlie Glotzbach, car number 99, is the leader. Ray Nichols Dodge. In second place, this Ford Talladega, number 17, driven by David Pearson. In third place, car number 32, that's Richard Brooks, the 1969 Rookie of the Year. And in fourth place is car number 40, the Plymouth Superbird, with Peter Hamilton. You know, Keith, Pete Hamilton was the 1968 Rookie of the Year on the Grand National Circuit, so the youngsters are doing great today. Charlie 
Clutch back. Whistling along in first place. David Pearson, however, is closing, closing steadily on him. Some great action coming up on the NASCAR Racing Series. March 8, Carolina 500 at Rockingham, North Carolina. March 22nd, Atlanta 500. April 5, Bristol 250 in Bristol, Tennessee. And now David Pearson has closed to where I think, Chris, he can get a reasonable draft on Charlie Klotzbeck. He's trying the high side to run it on the low side. Pearson's been going by on the bottom, but here he goes by on the top for a change. And he gets the lead over Charlie Klotzbeck. So it is David Pearson, Charlie Klotzbeck, Richard Brooks, and Peter Hamilton in that order. Buddy Arrington, broken ribs and shocked. That's the report from the hospital after his accident. The average speed has dropped to 134.6 key due to the long yellow flag for Arrington, but they're still running better than 189. And David Pearson is back in the lead for the third time. We'll be back for the finish of the Daytona 500, but right now let's join Jim McKay where men started competitive racing a long time before the automobile came along. All right, Jim, and we hope you can find a warm fireplace close by. Our weather for the 12th annual Daytona 500 continues very good. Temperature mid-60s, track temperature low 80s. The leader, number 17, Ford, David Pearson, Spartanburg, South Carolina. Car number 99 running right behind him. That's Charlie Glotzbach in a Dodge, but Charlie is actually a lap behind. He is in third place because of a black flag. The car running in second place is the Petty Blue Plymouth Superbird with Pete Hamilton driving. He is about a half a lap behind the leader, David Pearson. So he has worked his way through the traffic. Now let's go back with our videotape and show you in slow motion what caused the black flag for Charlie Glotzbach. It was a routine pit stop, Keith. Here he is about 21 seconds into it, a right side tire change, and of course the usual refueling process. There that 11 gallon can is held high, but the car comes down and is driven away, as you can see here, before anyone had a chance to put the gas cap on. He lights up the tires and drags down pit lane, and the attendant at the end of pit lane saw the cap dangling and ordered the black flag, which means he has to come in again. And here he comes. Stopping this time for a little bit more fuel, the windshield cleaning. They're putting on a new gas cap. There you can see the new one and the old one still dangling from the chain. And the front three, Pearson, Hamilton, Bobby Allison, more racing in a moment. We're heading toward the shadows of the day, toward the end of the Daytona 500. Car number 40, the Petty Blue Plymouth, is running in second place behind car number 17, David Pearson's Ford. And we're timing the interval between the leader, Pearson, and the second place car, Hamilton, and you can see it is 3.1 seconds, and that's not much. And here's Charlie Glotzbach back in the pits, and I think, Chris, you could say that Charlie was done in by the gas cap caper today. No question about it, Keith. He had tough luck here a year ago, lost it by one lap, and now driving out without a gas cap took any chance of victory away from him. He's just running it out. And we have trouble on turn two. Car number 32, Richard Books, apparently blew an engine, spun a couple of times and is out of the race, but that brings out the yellow flag and turns on the caution lights and slows the field down. And here comes the leader, David Pearson, immediately into the pits. And Chris, they're going for left tires and some fuel. This will close up the two cars, Keith. It'll eliminate that three-second interval when the green comes out again. Well, now here is the Plymouth. Pete Hamilton's car into the pits. So he takes the opportunity to jump in there and get some fresh rubber himself. He takes on right side tire. And you note they drag race down pit lane. This is a hurry up business. So David Pearson is out. Pete Hamilton immediately right behind him is out. Here is Tiny Lund. Tiny has had his troubles today. He is now outside the top 10. Earlier today, we talked with Pete Hamilton about his 1970 Plymouth Superbird. Here's what he told us about his car. I think that uh, the Plymouth Superbird that Richard Petty and I are, are running uh, really is, uh, is a, a new innovation as far as aerodynamics in race cars. The wing that we have is a great deal different than is on the Dodge. And our nose, uh, really the nose cone that's been put on this car is, is considerably different. The, the car is, uh, is a new car from what we had last year, and I think uh, much better handling race car. 
That's Pete Hamilton who is running in second place. The yellow flag is still out. The caution light still on and Hamilton is coming back down pit lane going back into the pits. The caution light is out because of Richard Brooks spin. He dumped apparently some oil on the low side of, of turn number two and they are putting left side tires on Pete Hamilton's car. Left side tires going that gives him four pieces of fresh rubber. So he'll go back out on the track. David Pearson chooses not to come back in. He remains out there. So here comes Pete Hamilton racing out of the pits and back onto the track and he'll try to close it up and get close to David Pearson. Here's Chris. Well, here we've got Richard Petty. Richard, how do you like playing pit manager? Well, not too good, but it uh, looks like the way Pete's running that uh, if it worked out all right, I'd be a pit manager. Why did you make two pit stops in succession with Peter? Well, we figured on changing left side tires, uh, really him and Pearson was running the same speed and, and Pete couldn't catch him, so Pearson, when he made his last stop, just got right side tires and uh, we was already behind, so we were really not taking too much of a chance on putting on new left side tires because we'll be right up behind him when the race gets started and uh, the car might handle a little bit better enough to be able to outrun him. Do you think he could slingshot him and on the last lap and come home first? Well, uh, I don't know, but it's after late to see. Looks like he could run with him, but I don't know if they got it. There you have it from Richard Petty, whose car went out early and has been serving as pit manager for Pete Hamill throughout the balance of this contest. And we'll watch and see if that strategy works out. Here is your leader, that is David Pearson, and car number 40, Pete Hamilton, under the yellow flag. The slow traffic has been able to wiggle his way through the pack and get right up on the bumper of the leader, David Pearson. Of course, at this juncture, when you have this kind of opportunity, I guess you simply try everything in the book that you can think about or put your fingers on. And when they come around this time, they should be getting the green flag, and we should finish the 12th annual Daytona 500 with a mighty roar, and the race is on. Keith, there's 26 cars still running out of the original 40, a high survival rate at these speeds. David Pearson in a Ford has the lead, and they're moving out of traffic right now as Pearson leads with Hamilton running right behind him. Tiny Lund is back in the pits. Tiny now is outside the top 10. The last 100 miles have been troublesome for him, but here are the two cars to watch. Number 17 is Pearson, number 40 is Hamilton. Hamilton is closing on the straight, closing steadily. He's taking the low groove, going into the turn. Let's see if he can handle him going through the turn. It's a little tricky to go down low like that. Boy, those new tires in that wing are really working for Hamilton here. Firmly implanting that Plymouth on the track and allowing him to race like this with Pearson. Here they come screaming down in front of the grandstand, traveling better than 180 miles an hour. They are wheel to wheel. Chris, they can reach out and shake hands with each other. And this is what the 103,800 people paid to see. Stock car racing Southern style. And I think every man, woman, and child is on their feet as Pete Hamilton goes into the lead. It's 50-50. Half the crowd is for him, the other half for Pearson. The Chrysler Rooters and the Ford Rooters are really up now. And we'll run the clock and see just exactly how fast Pete Hamilton is flying around the track. And I'll tell you that David Pearson is right there behind him. I might point out too, Chris, that nobody, none of the experts in picking winners before the race picked Pete Hamilton as a possible winner. If, if you're an expert, Keith, you don't pick a rookie. <laughs> We wonder now whether Pearson lying second is by design. They say that the best place to be on the last lap is in second place, so you can employ the slingshot. 48.3 seconds, that's 186.335 miles an hour, and that is really moving this late in a 500-mile race. Really an incredible performance by the equipment and the man. Close finishes are tradition here at Daytona. Now Pearson tries on the outside or tries to find room at any rate. It isn't over yet. I'll tell you, this Pete Hamilton hasn't been on the NASCAR Grand National Circuit very many times. His best performance last year was a fifth in Atlanta, but he looks like he knows exactly what he is doing, and he leads right now. David Pearson still very close. All eyes are on these two drivers. Pearson, three times a champion, an old pro, and Hamilton in his very first factory ride. Remember our sports doubleheader tomorrow here on ABC, 1.55 Eastern Time, NBA Basketball, Los Angeles at Boston, followed at 4 o'clock Eastern and Pacific Time by the American Sportsman. Pearson is still close. He's right in the draft, and here he goes. He's taking his run at Pete Hamilton right here, going into turn number three. Can he hold him? 
He went in very low there. Boy, oh boy, they're really at it now. Oh, look out! Fish is in trouble. He almost lost it. He almost lost it. David Pearson was out of shape, almost sideways. But he fought back tremendous strength, and the white flag is flying. Pete Hamilton has the lead, traveling at better than 186 miles an hour. A remarkable story for the young man from Massachusetts. And it appears that David Pearson has lost momentum, perhaps has lost the will to really try all out again, though I find that hard to believe because he is one of the great competitors in the history of NASCAR racing. We are watching two great competitors right here. Pete Hamilton in the Petty Blue Plymouth Superbird, leading and heading for the checkered flag. And David Pearson running right behind him, closing in to second place, and he'll hold that position, no question about it. And Pete Hamilton has won his first major NASCAR victory, the Daytona 500. David Pearson is second in a board, and Bobby Allison third in a dodge, and will go to victory lane in just a moment. Now comes that sweet, sweet moment for Pete Hamilton. Average speed of the race, 149.601 miles per hour. That is not a record. There were six caution flags for 45 laps or 112 miles an hour, which kept the race speed from being a new record, I think. There were 24 lead changes among 10 drivers. This young blonde was in the lead at the right time at the finish. Let's go to victory lane now with Chris Economaki. Peter, congratulations, a fine drive. Thank Got you, Chris. A little bit of strategy at the end with the tires, I'm sure, helped, didn't it? Well, it really did. You know, they, uh, Richard said, come back in, get left side tires, and uh, I just figured that was the way to go, and, uh, boy, he knew what he was talking about, I'll tell you that. Well, it was a great drive. Peter, did you have any problems during the race? Well, not too bad, no, really. Car worked pretty well all day, pretty much as planned. Uh, we had to make a little chassis adjustment about halfway through the race, but, boy, that was what, uh, they gave the car what we needed, and it uh, worked real good after that. I was real happy. Hey, the crew did a heck of a job, I, I'll tell you. These petty, these petty people, they're the best in the world, let me tell you. So is this Plymouth Superbird. You, look, you sound happy. <laughs> I really am. How old are you, Pete? 27. There you go, and he's single, girls. 